Now, given the theme of your conference is about making a difference and breaking down barriers, during this, these remarks, I just might share with you a few examples of some of the programs I've witnessed in my travels around the country. I do spend a lot of time meeting employment service providers and childcare providers. And I also have responsibility for apprenticeships and training. In fact, on Friday morning, I'll be in Melbourne speaking to Group Training Australia's conference and really looking forward to that. But one of the things I do enjoy is visiting childcare centres. My three children are grown up, but they've been in every form of childcare and I've seen a lot of iterations of childcare over the years. But I love to watch the interaction between the providers and the children. I was in Townsville a few months ago and I visited a centre where one child of about five seemed very, very attached to her carers, following them from room to room, constantly seeking cuddles. It turned out that her father had passed away from cancer a few short weeks beforehand. And here, the role of the centre was more vital than ever. It was evident that the childcare centre owners and staff were doing all they could to wrap support around this little girl as she dealt with her grief. And often there are many problems and barriers that children face on a daily basis that those caring for them need to be aware of and to factor in. I've also been very impressed with some of the early intervention programs that I've seen and been told about. For children coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, they often face enormous struggles to break out of a cycle of disadvantage. And here we truly do need to do more to prevent this cycle repeating itself, particularly in areas where we have intergenerational unemployment of up to four generations. We've got to be sure to take a real grassroots, ground up approach to addressing the disadvantage and the prospect of ending up on a lifetime of welfare. And while I may disagree with the academics in the early childhood sector about some things, some would even say about many things, one thing I am firmly on board with is an understanding that resilience that lasts your lifetime in children is really developed between the ages of about one and three before you even start preschool. And it is absolutely vital that when we intervene, we intervene that early. So many Australian families are dependent on childcare. In the minds of their children, given the amount of time they may spend with them, the carer is probably one of the most influential people in their world. For this reason, I understand it's critical we have the right people in the job. However, that's not to say that the right person always needs a specific qualification. I have met thousands of fabulous child carers or childhood educators who don't have a piece of paper to demonstrate their abilities. Yet thousands have raised their own families and worked in the industry for a number of years. This practical, real-world experience does need to be afforded the recognition it deserves. And this does lead me to a real issue that I do have. I do believe that the compliance regime under the National Quality Framework is top-heavy with paperwork, and I fear that, despite the new ratios, staff will spend far too much time on administrivia instead of what I like to call quality sandpit time. I have spoken to many, mainly young, new staff in the childcare industry, and they all say that the thing they weren't prepared for was the amount of time they would spend doing paperwork instead of playing and educating children. The new child staff ratios will cause an increase in fees that we're already seeing, even in the community sector. I've had reports, and my office takes calls every day from centres concerned about this, and I certainly had reports of increases of $20 a day in council-run centres, centres that operate on a cost recovery basis. So there is a real concern that such excessive fee increases will force a number of parents into backyard care. I've actually been sent some advertisements from one of our major newspapers that uh, quite clearly are offering backyard care. So I don't believe that I'm scaremongering when I say this. I would really just like the government to take a step back and slow down these changes. I am all for raising the quality of childcare, but I think that without the proper groundwork in place, there are some serious risks. And of course, training is one thing, and quality training is another, sometimes. Uh, with my vet and training hat on, one of the things I'm grappling with ha is how we ensure that the training we, our providers give is of sufficient quality. In Western Australia recently, I met with a childcare centre director who said she'd interviewed 
15 people with a certificate three in childcare, all from different providers, and she wouldn't give any of them, she said, even a two-hour trial on the floor of her childcare centre. Clearly, there are serious issues around the quality of our training. I recognise that many people here aren't involved in the childcare sector, but it is, I think, one of the topical issues at the moment, so I'll just spend a couple more minutes talking about it. I have, I have visited a great deal of centres. If somebody in this room operates a centre they'd like me to come and see, um, please, we, we, we're happy to do that. And one of the things that uh, I put a bit like an aged care home too, I think. You walk in and you immediately know. I walk into a centre and I immediately know if it's good, bad or indifferent. There is a sense about the happiness of the staff, the happiness of the children, the smooth running of the place that um, exists outside technical licensing and accreditation schemes, important though they are. But when I hear of, of workers who are just killing themselves to prove to an accreditor that they know how to do their job, it frustrates me. They know the child, but they have to provide this evidence to someone who comes in who doesn't know the child. Now, in another life, I worked in the tax office, and that was really a popular thing when I was getting elected. This is Susan, she's in the Liberal Party and she works in the tax office. <laughs> but um, one thing the tax office did taught me is that you risk manage. So even today, I've got to tell you, people think that they're, they fill in their tax return and somebody sits there at a desk checking through every number. Of course, that doesn't happen at all. It's all self-assessment because the tax office recognises the vast proportion of people meet their tax obligations and if they don't, it's only by a little bit and it doesn't matter. And they focus their attention on the people at the top of the, if you want to call it, a compliance pyramid. We absolutely have to do that when it comes to red tape in both the childcare sector and the aged care sector. You don't want to attract people to, to, these, to these jobs who are good at compliance. I mean, if I, if I think about job services for a moment, these are the people who, who get the most long-term unemployed into work. Again, they're people, pe they're people persons, like all of you are. They love the interaction with another human being. If they didn't, they'd be sitting writing software code somewhere. But they spend their time, 60% of their time, on compliance. Now, I love the early years learning framework. I think it's great. I think the play-based approach to learning is a fantastic thing. But I've also been in centres where um, the, the stressed childcare worker is, is too busy writing on the computer and taking digital photos to document the learning journey um, to actually sit there and play with the child. And one particular instance comes to mind where she was doing her best and filling in and the director of the centre walked behind her and said, you've spelt this wrong and you've spelt that wrong and you, you're not you know, your sentence doesn't make sense, they're sort of almost turned into an English test. And that's not what it should be. Yet this girl, when you saw the warmth that she generated with those children, the last thing you want is her discouraged out of the industry. As I said, not many of you are not involved in childcare. I'd like to turn briefly to another topic that, um, uh, that, that I think is useful to talk about, and that is the issues that we face in the community sector in rural and western New South Wales. And my lecture, of course, has the whole of the New South Wales South Australian border, it goes up to Tibbaburra, Cameron's Corner, which is the border of New South Wales, South Australia, and Queensland. And geographically, it presents challenges, not just for me, which is no big deal, but for people who work in that area and who have as their area of operations huge tracts of um, quite remotely settled country. So when I talk to people in your industry there, um, often based in Broken Hill, but always on the road, um, I recognise those challenges and I recognise the difficulties you face. Healthcare is a good example. The Flying Doctor Service does an amazing job staffing rural and remote hospitals and ensuring the equipment they ha that they have the equipment they need but it's always a battle because the numbers are so low. Many rural communities have been forced to offer salary and housing packages well above the norm in order to secure the services of a local doctor. And often Australian trained doctors aren't willing to take up these vacancies, preferring instead to spend those early years in big city hospitals. And I'm a f fantastic supporter of our overseas trained doctors, but it's hard to get them and it's hard to keep them and there are some quite significant learning curves once they do arrive, often unsupported, in a small country town. The rural barriers faced by the health profession are generally reiterated across the board. Teaching is another profession where it may be difficult to encourage people to go to remote communities such as, for example, Wilcannia, which is in my electorate. 
the current method of allocating teachers, t state departments tend to send younger teachers, younger inexperienced teachers to remote locations. And they don't always get the mentoring that they need in order to flourish. And so I've seen some teachers thrown in at the deep end and that leads them to become discouraged and exit the profession, not to mention the impact that it has on children. Having said that, I have seen some fantastic uh, teachers just out of training college, really energetic and encouraged and working with disadvantaged kids. The aged care sector presents challenges in Broken Hill. We've had recent problems. There are insufficient dementia beds. And this, is, this forces people into care facilities, possibly hundreds of kilometres away, where their families just can't visit. My electorate has been hard hit by 10 years of drought. And then, of course, extensive floods last year. The hay plain was underwater, towns were cut off, uh, we couldn't get the flood assistance that uh, was rightly given to Queensland and Victoria because our flooded areas were small, because they are small, and there weren't many affected, but for the people affected it was just as much of a tragedy as if you were part of a wider event. So very frustrating dealing with the bureaucracy around that. We also saw at the end of last year plagues of locusts swarming the electorate. At one stage a one kilometre deep and 25 kilometre wide swarm formed in Daniloquin and Kanaga, absolutely wiping out everything in its path. The damage is unbelievable. We've just had a plague of mice, it's a bit like the seven biblical plagues, and, um, and we, have, um, we have a plague of rabbits starting. So. Um, it's hard to get people excited about rabbits. I get very excited about rabbits because I was a farmer for 17 years and I know that um, the rabbit is the single, the single object that destroyed the pastoral regions of Australia after white settlement. So we've had a number of challenges, but um, I love meeting the, the people that I represent because they do inspire me and they are remarkable. And if I can just think of a few, a young fellow, he's probably not that young now, um, from Daniloquin called Jonathan, who is a member of the Stolen Generations. And when we had the apology to the Stolen Generations, uh, he, was, he contacted me. Now, I know that I had many constituents affected, but, but Jonathan was quite determined. He wanted to come to Canberra, he wanted to meet Kevin Rudd, and he wanted his story told. And he did those things, and uh, he helped me write the story of his life, which was, as many of those stories are, um, incredibly tragic. And... We spoke about it in Parliament, and yes, he did get to meet Kevin Rudd, and he also met Ken White, who's an Aboriginal MP from Western Australia, and he was, he was excited. He keeps in touch with me, and, um, and I'm amazed when I think of the hardships that he's gone through that he still thinks of other people the way he does. He's, he's quite a remarkable human being. So um, um, that, that is Jonathan, and I do have a lot of disadvantaged Indigenous communities. Uh, I visit Wilcannia quite regularly, and... Um, it hurts me when I see the boys just, you know, they should be at school, they're usually hanging around at the river, and, you know, I go down and talk to them and say, what are you all up to? And they look at the ground and they find it really hard to look me in the eye, and I say, what do you want, what do you need here? Um, and the last time I asked that question, they said, well, a skate park would be good, or something to do would be good. And, you know, you just feel like screaming. As you all know, there's probably about $30 million of public funding that comes into Wilcannia every year, but it doesn't seem to have produced um, something for those, for those kids to do. The experience of women on the land, uh, as I said, I was a, I was a woman on the land for um, 17 years and went through, believe me, all the highs and lows and um, some great memories and some not so great ones. But when I look at the women of the Western Division, on their own, completely, with um, husbands generally who struggle um, with the fact that their business is going broke, struggle with the fact that they can't provide for their family, tend to be quiet people anyway, so certainly aren't going to talk about their feelings and never going to walk into a building that says community mental health, um, and they just battle on. And what the women do to keep the families together, the kids come home from university um, saying, look, we're not going to let you try and cope on your own, and this went on and on and on, year after year after year. So um, it, was, it was something that I, I, was, I was amazed by. I mentioned briefly red tape, and I'll just wind up on that point because I want to give people the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we really are serious about reducing red tape. If I can come up with something that coalition policy that I think everybody in Australia would agree with, it's reducing red tape. Um, 
and anyone has any good ideas about that, please send them to me because it's a firm commitment that we are going to make. I want to see a transparent, productive system, both in training, both in um, childcare, which I represent, and certainly in job services. Transparency is vital, quality is vital, it's difficult. Thank you all for what you do, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, you were uh, keen to reduce red tape. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how you would do that? Well, I know, first I recognise it's not easy, but we have, well, we have 300 pages of draft regulations for the new national quality system in childcare, and hanging off that is probably at least the same number again of pages of, of guidelines and further detail. And if you look at the amount of compliance that people had to do only five years ago compared to now, you can see that it's multiplied. So I mentioned risk managing, in other words, not targeting everybody all the time about everything, but also just applying some common sense tests. And I think we have to say to um, public service departments, and I've, I've, I've been a bureaucrat and, I'm, I, and, and I, I know the challenges, um, is that you, 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 know, you have to reduce the quantity of regulation by half as a start. And that will force people in those positions to take out all the things that are unimportant. And you know that if you look through these regulations, whatever section it's in, um, you can in fact remove, some of them seem a little bit silly and unnecessary. I mean, there's lots of detail about not having a tomato plant in the garden of a childcare centre. This morning there was an article saying children are wrapped in bubble wrap and we've got to have more nature type environments. But I've been to childcare centres where there are certain plants that you're not allowed, even inside, up out of the way of children. And I mean, I know a tomato is a nightshade plant, but you know, you're not allowed to have running water. One centre had built a nice stream and she said, look, under the new rules, I can't have that. So just common sense test, please. Uh, Susan, I'm just wondering, in, um, in the political sphere, uh, we, we recognise here there's quite large differences for regional and remote you know, delivery of services, training and so on. In, in the political sphere, is that recognised or not recognised or how do you lobby that? Um, because it is quite different and um, yeah, I just want your views hmm. on that one. Well, it is different and it does need to be recognised and if I can get a little bit political here, apologies, I don't want to be but I am a politician. I felt it was very disingenuous of the current childcare minister to say when it came to her new quality standards, when rural and regional centres were screaming, we can't do this, it's not possible for us to employ this proportion of qualified staff by 2014. Um, the response through her, through her bureaucrats from her, was, um, oh well, there'll be exemptions for rural and regional centres. If you think this quality agenda is so important, then don't say that rural and regional centres aren't important enough to be included or that it's in the too hard basket. I mean, I obviously have a disagreement about how much of these we need, but I think that underscores perfectly how, um, how governments don't recognise the realities of rural and regional Australia. Just yesterday we heard um, from a gentleman from ASQA, which is the new national vet regulator. And, and I'm all for national rather than all the states being different. I, I think that's a good move. What I didn't hear and what I haven't seen on the website, and, and it, it mightn't be in your sphere <laughs> of influence, um, was how the end user is impacted. So they talked about the ability to rescind a qualification in in whatever, if the a registered training organisation isn't delivering quality and things like that. What I didn't see was the partnership with the people to actually nurture them, that student, through somewhere to get another... So I think there should be another pot of money or another bunch of, not guidelines, but another piece of the policy that allows then that partnership for that end user to be upskilled, accredited, and maybe a, a partnership with the RTO that has fallen over to be guided through and out or guided through and up again. And I just think that we can go vet regulator, but where's the partnership with the people? Mm. So I was just wondering... So you're, uh, you're saying that if, if 
the vet regulator finds something lacking, yes. then they basically say, well, that's not our problem. Someone else will have to well, sort I that. Well, didn't, I didn't know. That's the message mm. I got yesterday. So I was looking for the end part. Yeah. And so when you were t talking about cutting red tape, I thought, oh, gee, I hope we've got the end part of it in, in our mind as well as mm. just the regulation part. I think you're making a really good point. It might interest you to know that the vet regulator legislation hasn't even gone through the Senate, uh, even though um, it has gone through the lower house and it will go through the Senate. So it's very new and the establishment of um, the organisation is, is, is at an early stage. I have problems with the concept, mainly because West Australia and Victoria said, we don't want to be part of the national vet regulator, so how can it be national if you don't have West Australia and Victoria? But I agree with you. The job of the um, vet regulator is, is one of audit and compliance. Now, I don't know that that's going to audit the student's experience. It's basically going to say, it's, you know, you're providing these competencies, this course ticks the boxes, but there's no way in the world uh, with, the, with the number of RTOs in the country and, and, and public providers, private and public, that the vet regulator can possibly do other than just desktop compliance with most of them. And nor should it, I imagine. But it doesn't have the scope to do what you think it probably could. It doesn't have the scope to support the industry in any way. It is just going to be an audit and compliance. And one of the other problems I have with it is going to cost the RTO to be audited and compliant and comply. Um, so it's fine for an organisation to say, well, um, you, you know, we, we need to make sure that you meet a certain set of standards. We're flying to your remote location. We're spending three nights. We're bringing a team of three people. We're staying in your most expensive hotel or the public service travel rate, and you pick up the tab. If you're a cross-border RTO, that is going to be a substantial impost on you. And I wouldn't like to see small RTOs, because I've seen some really good small RTOs, pushed out of the system. Um, in fact, what they will probably be forced to do is come under the shelter of a, of a bigger provider and sometimes and form a partnership or a relationship with them, for example, the local TAFE in their area, and that won't necessarily be a bad thing either. I, let me be clear, I support, I'm a big supporter of TAFE. So yes, partnerships can form, but um, quality. I, if anyone has an idea in this room about how we can um, QA the subject matter in a course so that every student can provide the information that other students need in a clear and transparent way that, that proves that it's a good course and that it's meeting the outcome. So if you're, if you're training, I know there's some out there training childcare workers, but you wouldn't be one of those 15 workers who's, who the childcare provider said, no, I can't even give you a trial on the floor, you're so hopeless. Um, but yes, we haven't really got clear QA and um, transparency in the vet sector with training and no, the vet regulator is not going to do that.